Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Stephanie Chuding, and I am the Education Coordinator at 100 Miles. And I want to give an extra special welcome to our members this evening. Um, without your support, we couldn't have programs like this. If you are not a member and are interested in becoming a member, you can visit our website at 100miles.org. Um, but you're not here to see me speak this evening. So I am have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Leslie Sauter. She is currently um, a professor at the College of Charleston, where she teaches marine geology, seafloor mapping, seafloor research. Um, and she, oops, excuse me. Um, where she, she is also the founder of the Project Oceana at the College of Charleston since 2001 and directs the college's seafloor mapping program called BEAMS. So we are super excited to hear about her research and the work she's been doing. And without further ado, I'm going to pass it off. So thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. And hello to everyone. And I'm sorry we can't do this in person because I'd love to meet you all. <laughs> Um, but thank you for coming and I'm excited to tell you about this amazing expedition that I was very fortunate to be part of in 2018 and it was well off the coast of the southeast US and we explored many different habitats on the seabed and found many different types of deep sea coral, which is the focus of this particular talk. So I'm going to continue and uh, please submit questions if you have any. And let me see if this actually advances. <laughs> there we go. It's always hard to get it going there. So uh, the expedition that I was a part of was hosted by NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Office of Exploration and Research, or OER. And OER's mission is to explore relatively unknown areas of the sea floor and typically the deep sea. We're not looking at coastal waters so much. So that requires a large vessel. This is the Okeanos Explorer and it is dedicated to exploration. And how this works is in order to explore the sea floor, we first have to map it in detail. We call that high resolution mapping. So at this point in time, if you were to go onto Google Earth or any other application that shows a map of the sea floor, you think, well, we've got it all mapped already, but we have it mapped as though you didn't have glasses on and you needed a prescription badly, or if you were looking through the bottoms of Coke bottles. So it's very blurry view, most of the seabed. Only about 5% of the sea floor has been mapped in detail in high resolution. And we are advancing that percentage very rapidly using the technology called multi-beam sonar. So if you're familiar with sonar, it's um, an echo sounder, sound bounces off the seabed and comes back to the ship. In the case of multi-beam sonar, there's a lot of sound in a swath as depicted here. And we go back and forth, these black lines are the track lines. We go back and forth measuring the seafloor depths using sound. And if we overlap just right, we call it mowing the lawn, just like you have to overlap so you the weeds don't poke through, um, you get this incredible map surface in high resolution. It's a tremendous amount of data. And from that information, we can color code it. We can do all sorts of things with it and look at it in 3D, everything. So it has really opened our eyes to the seafloor because we can't see it. And you know you can't go explore something without a good map. Imagine investigating the national parks without a good map. So that's the first step. We got to map the seafloor in detail. Once we have some good maps, then we can pick sites that we want to explore in detail and actually visualize using cameras. These water depths are too deep for, um, for scuba, for sure. We're talking about more than 500 meters water depth. But we do have robotic vehicles that can go down with video camera in high definition and with still cameras as well. And these particular vehicles are called remotely operated vehicles or ROVs. And NOAA, the NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer has two ROVs, a smaller one called Sirios. And Sirios hovers above the larger workhorse, which is 
nicknamed D2 or Deep Discoverer. And these two vehicles are deployed together and D2 is the one closer to the seabed and gets the high resolution close up images while Sirius hovers above to get the bigger view and to keep an eye on D2 as well. To give you a sense of scale, um, oh, sorry, before I do that, uh, what these vehicles do is they give us our eye on the seafloor and we call that ground truth. And so through using video cameras and still images, and here are the video camera and the uh, camera, the regular still image camera, we can get incredible views close up. We also can take limited samples. We have a manipulator arm and all of this is controlled from the ship. There's no, these are unmanned vehicles. So we are tethered to the ship and we can control this little manipulator arm and collect samples. The larger samples like rocks and other things that are too large for other baskets go in these forward baskets. And there are also bins that tuck underneath a shelf so that nothing can get out. But we really limit how much sample material. We only take samples if it's a rare species or we don't know what it is, or if we wanna collect information on its DNA or something. To give you a sense of the scale of D2, I'm 5'8". And so, uh, you know, if I stood up, I'm only half the height of this thing. These are large vehicles. So, those two workhorses collect most of the data after we have done our mapping. And this is all done with the Okeanos Explorer. Typically, there is an expedition, maybe two to three weeks of mapping, and that is followed by the ROV dive expeditions where we go to the seafloor itself. During any operation that the Okeanos has, you can uh, tune in and watch live through telepresence what we are seeing on the seafloor. You can actually watch the data being collected if you're interested in mapping. Much more uh, interesting, I will admit, is the video of the seabed. And so thousands of people around the globe tune in at a time and it's really an incredible um, operation. So for every dive expedition, and that's the one that I was on, there are only three scientists on board. There are a lot of people, there are almost 50 people on board, but only three of them are scientists. And there's a geology lead, that was me, and a biology lead, Cheryl Morrison. And then we have a sampling manager and she, is, uh, she was from the Smithsonian. And we were the three Mouseketeers here on our expedition. And for every expedition, there is a NOAA lead coordinator and she's in charge, Casey Cantwell was ours, but they're in charge with all the webcasts, the live telepresence, everything, and conducting daily operations. There's also a lead mapper on board from NOAA, and that person at night, as we go from one dive site to the next dive site, we take advantage of that time, we turn on the multi-beam so we're collecting additional data. And so we always have a mapping lead. So in addition to the ship's officers and crew, which is about half of the people on board, we have the three science members and with the NOAA group, we have five members from NOAA. But that's not everybody. We also have a videography team um, who are working almost around the clock, working with the video that we collect immediately and also with the still images because they make daily highlight videos that get loaded up to the web the next day. So they're very busy and very um, good at their jobs. And then there's a team of 10 folks who um, supervise all of these remotely operated vehicles. So it's a large uh, collaborative group. However, the science that we conduct with only three scientists on board, we can't possibly identify everything we see. Um, there's a wealth of knowledge that three of us couldn't actually handle alone. So because of the telepresence, we also have chat room scientists logged on watching in real time as we see the seafloor, they're seeing it, and they are communicating with us on their laptops all the time, telling us what they think they see. And at any one 
dive and a dive would last from six to eight hours every day we do a dive we'd have between 35 and maybe 40 scientists in our expedition of three weeks we had a total of over 200 scientists from around the globe contributing their wealth of knowledge and it's so it's an incredible um, collaborative effort so both of the rovs are deployed in order to get the video stream back, we have to have a cable, a fiber optic kind of cable, and we also have to supply power to both vehicles. So these are tethered. And in the operations room, looks like NASA Command Center, and it's exactly what it is, just like that. We have three pilots, with the one in the middle here is controlling the uh, D2, the main ROV. We have the second one who is controlling the Sirius, the smaller one that hovers. Here's his screen looking down at D2 that is near the seafloor. This would be the view that D2 has. And then the third person is in charge of the navigation, um, controlling uh, the ship's navigation as compared to the ROV navigation. On the right in the front is another suite of panels, and that's where the lead videographer, he's the one, he or she is the one that controls the lighting, the color balance, the zooming and all that of what both of these vehicles are viewing. In the back row are the two lead scientists, that's me and that's Cheryl, and we have our chat room scientists following along with us, and we have a videographer who is immediately taking clips of the really cool video that comes up and making the beginnings of those highlight videos. So it's, it's an amazing and a very exciting kind of expedition because it's all new to everybody. So I'm gonna show this little video of why we explore. Given the proximity of so many millions of people that live along the Southeast coast, it seems that of course, this area would be very well known and we would know exactly where everything is. And that's so not true. Every dive that we've done has been in places where people have not been before. And so all of this information is really important to managing our deep sea resources. This large area was deemed a coral habitat area of particular concern by the South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council in 2010. So I cut that video short. The full length video is on the NOAA website and I'll give you the link later. So let me introduce you where we went and what we saw. Our continental margin, first of all, what is a continental margin? It's the underwater portion of the rest of the continent. It just happens to be below sea level right now. And uh, the broad part that is relatively shallow that extends out to an edge of about 200 meters water depth is called the shelf. Off of North Carolina and farther north, it then drops off rather steeply to water depths of maybe five and six kilometers. But our region off the Southeast US coast, including Georgia, <laughs> has a very different kind of margin. We have the shelf and then it drops off a little bit to about 800 meters and then flattens out again and gradually descends to about 1200 meters and then drops off rapidly. This broad plateau region is called the Blake Plateau. And as I say, it's rather unique to continental margins. This sharply dropping off edge is called the Blake Escarpment. These are the two areas that I'm gonna show you some of the dives that we, um, where we visited. The other thing that's interesting about our coastline is, and the Blake Plateau region, it is highly impacted and influenced by the Gulf Stream. And hopefully you know that the Gulf Stream comes out of the Gulf of Mexico as the loop current, and then it squeezes up through the Florida Straits and with high velocity, hugs the edge of that continental shelf. And so it is bringing warm waters. That's what makes our environment in Charleston and Georgia uh, much muggier than it would normally be is the Gulf Stream bringing that very moist air along with the hot 
waters, but it's also bringing nutrients and food particles. And so it supplies food for deep sea corals and for other organisms that like those deep sea habitats. So we'll look at the uh, effects of the Gulf Stream coming up as well. So before 2018, uh, here again is the Southeast US margin or coast and the white area is the edge of the continental shelf. The black areas shown here, these blocks, are the only areas that we had mapped in high resolution in detail prior to 2018. We had, met, we had mapped this area, I'll show you some of those maps actually, and we knew there was a good chance of deep sea coral out there and it had been explored somewhat. But all of this light blue area had not been mapped. These color blocks were the first new maps that were generated of this area in 2018, right before our dive expedition. So basically this whole region was largely unexplored because we didn't have the good maps. Since 2018, NOAA has done a fantastic job to map in high resolution a lot more of this region. So now you see these broad areas have been slowly filled and it takes a lot of time and this huge deeper area, NOAA and other groups have been contributing to mapping this area. I wanna give a shout out to my son who works for NOAA as a seafloor mapper. He's a, you know, the apple didn't fall very far from that tree. And he compiled this beautiful map for me where the water depths are colorized for 200 meters in red to about 1500 meters in purple. And so that's the depth range that we are very interested in examining and exploring because that's where the deep sea corals are. So you can see a lot more detail and just to give you a comparison, if you zoom in on Google Earth or other apps that have the existing um, maps, this is the kind of resolution you'll see. It looks very flat and featureless, overlaying with the new detailed maps. So we know so much more already. There are gullies, there are cliffs, there are uh, you'll hear a lot more about mounds and all sorts of features that we did not know were there until recently. So this really is a new world of exploration for us. And yet there's still more to be done. We've only covered just, on, just above half of the Blake Plateau at this point. So from even earlier data that we had, that area in here that I showed was mapped in 2013, and it showed the possibility of deep coral habitat. So all of these blue dots are showing you locations that have been explored since 1987. Most of these dots, um, well, about half of them are probably um, since 2000. And NOAA has conducted many of these, but many other groups have also been very keen to find out where these deep sea coral habitats are. The red box, if you remember from the video I showed at the beginning, that is the South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council's um, designated deep coral habitat area of particular concern. So there are lots of acronyms, but that's what an HAPC is. And this is the deep coral. And you can see that um, the blue dots are beyond that range because we've started to explore beyond that range. And we are finding deep coral habitat at all of these blue dots. So every blue dot here, deep coral habitat has been found. The blank areas just haven't been explored yet. So tip of the iceberg in terms of what we can learn from uh, visiting the seabed. So we have this broad variety of now better mapped seafloor features and geologic habitat because really the corals have to live on something, they have to live on the geology. So that's why they do need geologists, fortunately. So I'm going to show you just a handful of the sites that we visited. These are the ones that I think are most interesting in terms of the deep sea coral. So the exploration's focus, particularly our, uh, our mission, was to look at these vulnerable marine habitats looking specifically for the deep sea coral and often 
the deep sea sponges. And sponges are another group that we know so little about, the deep sea sponges. They're very hard to identify and not that many people study them. So we are also interested in their habitat. And it turns out the corals and sponges often share habitats. So that is a nice thing to uh, be able to find both. But there are also many other species that coexist in these habitats. So while we're looking for deep sea coral, we're also looking at everything else. We're you know, collecting all this amazing video. We are hopefully seeing new species, but to actually identify it, you'd have to get a sample of it. And if it's swimming by, you just have the video. Um, but also, if we see a known species, is it in a place beyond where we've known it to exist? That's what an expanded range is. So it's just adding a lot of new information. And this is so important, seeing who lives with whom, who's associated with whom, um, how they feed, how they uh, predator and prey relationships, you know, where they live and how they live. We don't know this um, when we sample the bottom without seeing it. So that ground truth is so important to learning so much about these small environments or large environments as they may be. The expeditions also look at gas seep areas and submarine canyons, as well as shipwrecks or maritime heritage sites. We did all of that on our expedition, but I'm only going to present the deep sea coral today. Just, we don't have time. <laughs> so I'm gonna show you, first of all, um, talk about what is a deep sea coral. Most of you are probably familiar with coral reefs that you can dive on and snorkel to, and they live in shallow, sunlit waters, warm waters. They're a whole different group of, um, I mean, they may have relatives to deep sea corals, but their whole behavior is very different. Deep sea corals live in cold water. They live at depth where there's no light. So they don't have algal symbionts. They don't have algae living within their tentacles, which is what gives shallow water corals their color. So these corals, you can see some do have color, are not colored by algae. Um, they feed by uh, grabbing with their tentacles suspended materials. So they have to have currents. They have to be in areas with currents where particles of food fly by basically and they can grab them with their tentacles. The Gulf Stream provides a lot of that current and the food but corals have to hold on somewhere. So these corals, just like shallow water corals, need to attach to something. So often they need rocky substrate. They need something hard on which to attach. And then they grow in colonies. Every picture here is a colony of coral. An individual coral polyp is what you see with the tentacles. There are different groups. You may have heard of black corals. These are um, oct uh, octocorals, or, or they're soft corals, excuse me, octocorals, including bamboo corals, zoanthids, and then the very important stony corals that are cousins to the shallow water corals, like the brain corals that, and staghorns, because they build an exoskeleton of calcium carbonate. So we call them stony cor corals, and they're very important in the deep sea habitat world. And I'll show you that coming up. So that's your little primer on deep sea corals. There's no quiz at the end, but I, I might ask you questions, so take notes. Um, so anyway, we had 17 dives on our three week expedition. Some of them were north of this picture, but the ones I'm going to start with talking about are on the eastern edge of the Blake Plateau. And if you remember, this is called the Blake Escarpment where it drops off. This is the plateau and this is the Blake Escarpment. And we call these areas intraslope terraces. I'm just gonna show you some uh, maps. These were the maps collected right before our dive expedition. And it looks fairly featureless uh, from a distance, but zoomed in, you'll see that there's a lot of detail in here. And we can only visit a very tiny portion of each of these. This is a large area that was mapped and it's on the edge of the Blake Escarpment. So what is a, an intraslope terrace? If you were to take a slice down 
through the rocks of our continental margin. Georgia would be here. We have the shelf. Gray's Reef would be about here. And then it drops off to maybe 500, 800 meters. And then that broad, gently sloping, relatively flat lake plateau. And then it drops again. If we zoom in on this, again, that's the Blake Escarpment. If we zoom in, what we see is that this whole Blake Plateau, and we've known this for a long time, is built from layers of rock, layers of sediments that have consolidated into hard rock, limestones and sandstones through millions of years. And where the edges of those rocks are broken up by, from currents, from faulting, whatever, you see that there's sort of a stair step like terrace with each of those layers forming it. And you'll see this in the video. So we call this an intraslope terrace. D2, not shown to scale here, but we typically start a dive at the base of some vertical rise or nearly vertical rise, and we slowly move up. So that's what our dive plan is going to be on this area. Those three areas that we dove on all have different dive depths and, of course, uh, identifications. But in three dimensions, and again, this is all multi-beam sonar, here's the dive route, the very steep intraslope terrace. Here's another one. You can see kind of the stair stepping there. And here's another part of a stair step, and you'll see there are many layers. And this is the one, dive four, that I'm going to highlight with the video. So we're gonna start at the base of the intraslope terrace. And um, of course you see these wonderful images of organisms, but they are sitting on, on sandy sea floor. It's not rocky. It's very hard to attach to. You typically see very few organisms. They're scattered here and there. Um, once in a while you find one that's clinging to a rock that is below maybe the sand. Um, but most of these organisms are few and far between and living on sand. But as soon as you start getting near to these intraslope terraces, you start seeing rocks. And as soon as you start seeing rocks here, you can see the layers of rocks. Sometimes you'll see these two red dots. Those red dots are laser beams. They are 10 centimeters apart. So we use them to give us a sense of scale. But here you see wherever there are rocks, there are corals and other things clinging to them. This is a bubblegum coral, a paragorgia, and it's probably six feet in height. We don't collect those. If we do any collection, we might take a little snip of the end. So I'll show this very quickly again. We might take just a little bit of an end, but there are many different species of corals in here. Everything you see in this picture is some organism clinging to the rock. Here's some sponges, all sorts of organisms. And again, the Paragorgia. This organism is probably a thousand years old. They grow very slowly. So we definitely don't want to grab a whole one and pull it up to look at it. So here's some still shots. This is one of those bamboo corals. Again, probably several hundred to almost a thousand years. So we did take a little clip of it to age it and to get its DNA. Here's a sponge. This is the top of the rocky ledges and you can see those layers of rock. So this dive showed us the diversity that all the different species of coral that are coexisting in these environments. So there's enough food, there's enough current, it's cold and it's deep. This is 1300 meters, 1200 meters water depth. And they coexist with these sponges and many other organisms that I'm not gonna have time to show you. I wanna focus more though on the bioherms. These are mound structures that are constructed by organisms. So we call them bioherms and they're four sites that I will introduce you to. But first, let me talk about how a mound forms. So if you remember from earlier, I talked about stony corals. They have that exoskeleton of calcium carbonate. This is not a stony coral, but it is living on top of dead stony coral rubble. These white organisms are actually very healthy, alive, 
stony coral. And this is the key species that we find in our region. There's another one that we see in shallower and farther south, but this is Lophelia pertusa. It is the main stony coral um, mound constructing um, coral species. And if you look at it closely, you see that it has this calcium carbonate exoskeleton and this community of polyps, the individual corals living within it. So when it's healthy, it's white. So if you've heard of coral bleaching, coral bleaching is really only for shallow water corals because when they're healthy, they're colorized due to that algae. When shallow water corals bleach, it means the algae have left the premises. And what you see is the calcium carbonate. Those corals don't want to be without their algal symbionts. But in deep waters, bright white corals actually indicate healthy corals. When they die though, they become substrate. They become that hard foundation for something else to attach to. So all of this brown stuff is old dead rubble of Lophelia pertusa. Sometimes it collapses due to, you know, organisms, it breaks down, um, but things begin to cling to it. A lot of hydroids, other small organisms, and as I said earlier, this large madrepora octocoral also uses as a substrate. So if this happens, year after year, decade after decade, for thousands of years, what happens is the corals build on top of the dead corals and they build upward because the best place to survive is up in the current. The Gulf Stream is above us here. We're in 600 to maybe 800 meters of water. There's still plenty of current even on the bottom, but the higher you are in that current, the more chance you're gonna get if you're a coral, the more chance you're gonna get food. So at the tops of these mounds, other investigators had found living coral at the tops where the currents were greatest. The mounds build vertically through time. So if we look at our high resolution map, we're gonna start here on the Western Blake Plateau in depths ranging from 600 to 850 meters. You see all these little nubs on the seafloor. This box here is illustrated by the larger area and the Gulf Stream comes up through here. The two dots are the two sites that we dove on and you can see that the Gulf Stream is influencing this whole area, but there's a lot more going on than just these little pock marks. But what we thought was, well, these are likely to be coral mounds. So let's go dive on one. Let's go dive on two. So we picked two sites and one of those sites was a mound structure that was mapped at being 100 meters tall. From the seabed to the top, it's 100 meters. That is almost the length of a football field. So turn a football field on its edge and that's the height. So we started at the base and went up to the top. Here's a topographic map and these are just some of the maps that we used to figure that out. The video shows the other site. This is the area, we, it's nicknamed Million Mounds. All of those we hypothesize are deep sea coral mounds. We went up the three humped mound here. And so the two mounds that we showed, that, that we dove on both at the top showed all of this living Lophelia pertusa. Remember it's bright white. So this is the view from Sirius looking down. You can see very thriving colonies of the living Lophelia. And here you see up close, there's a lot of dead Lophelia, but that's okay. That is home to a lot of other organisms. Here's the hydroids, these are other corals, these are sponges. There are echinoderms, that's an urchin, and that's up close of that urchin. There are fish that feed on organisms, there are sea stars. There are all sorts, well, we collected a sponge and it, we had no idea what the name of it was. Um, and then we see these other organisms living in and among the living corals and within the dead coral structure. The golden crab, 
is a highly sought after large crab, meaty crab. So where does it live? Do we need to protect those areas? If you grab trawl for a crab, you're going to destroy a lot of this area. So all those nooks and crannies that that uh, collapsed coral, there's tons of stuff down in there as well, including fish that use that as hiding place and habitat. And you can see all these sea stars too. Um, these, uh, this was a strange black blob that we encountered. Looking up close, it looked very peculiar. Nobody in the chat room knew what it was at first. We took a sample of it and it turns out it's an encrusting sponge. So we learned some new things. I don't think it's a new species, but none of us had ever seen it before. So that's just two dives. That's footage from two dives. It was incredibly diverse, not just of corals, but also of many other organisms utilizing those mound structures as habitat. Another area we dove on, first of all, we tried to dive on this side of the area. This is called the Charleston Bump. And we wanted to dive here, but the Gulf Stream was just too strong. It was not safe to deploy the ROV. So we ended up having to go way over here. We looked at the maps we had. We had to kind of fly, you know, fly by the seat of our pants. Where should we go dive? We wanted to dive on these, this chain of features. We didn't know what that was. We ended up having to go way down here just to dive safely on this knife-like ridge, so it's dive seven, knife-like ridge. As a geologist, I want to know what the heck that was, what kind of rock it was. So we started at the base and went across to the top. It's quite steep, again, up the steep edge and across the top. And lo and behold, all across the top, it was living coral communities on top of the dead coral communities. This whole thing was a coral mound as well but the edges had eroded and slid down. That's why it looked like a knife-like ridge, but it was actually a series of coral mounds farther away from shore and out of the influence of the Gulf Stream than we ever expected. And it was abundant with many organisms, including these stony corals. So it was a really cool discovery. And with that knowledge, it just so happened that my co-lead, Cheryl Morrison, was about to go on another expedition with a group called Deep Search using the submersible Alvin. And they were going to this area and they were hoping to find deep sea corals. And we said, you are gonna find deep sea corals because we found them down here and these look even more like mound structures. Here it is in 3D. We dove just off the picture here. These are all what look like from our new maps, individual mounds and chains. And they're along the edge of these steep edges of rock. So it's a cliff here, but there are mounds along the edge. And sure enough, here's the Alvin, the next expedition that was co-sponsored by NOAA and the National Science Foundation. I think they played a part. They used the Alvin and they verified that yes, it's 160 miles off of South Carolina, Georgia, and it's 85 mile long deep sea coral reef dominated by this Lophelia pertusa as the foundation species. Many other species of corals were living on top of it, but the foundation again was Lophelia pertusa. So that made great headlines and has brought a lot of attention to deep sea research for corals. So really excited that we played a small role in seeing that just before they did. The last mound that I want to show you is Lophelia Banks. And this is a, already a marine protected area because as the name implies, we already knew it was a coral mound inhabited mostly or dominated by Lophelia. So we, and it had been explored the tops of it, but we wanted to check out the flanks and the Gulf Stream um, is coming up from the right here across it. You can see how the Gulf Stream kind of shapes that edge. And we, it's a little shallower here. So we didn't know what to expect, but we saw, certainly expected to find Lophelia. And instead we found no living colonies of Lophelia. We saw tons of dead rubble and all of these critters are living on top of the dead Lophelia rubble dominated by these anemones, which are cousins to corals for sure. 
and squat lobsters and other soft corals and um, cusk eels hiding in the rubble, but a very different kind of habitat. So we did not expect that. The other thing we encountered, oh, let's go to the next one. Oop, here we go. <laughs> Sorry about that is the wreckfish. And if you have ever had wreckfish to eat, it's very tasty. Here are my 10 centimeter measuring devices. We saw some that were over a meter long and they know a good protected habitat when they see one, they are thriving in here. I had been on submersible dives on the Charleston bump in the early 2000s with George Sedbury and his South Carolina DNR group. And we looked at the Charleston bump, which is the only known spawning habitat for this fish. The only place in the North Atlantic, I should say, where we know that they come to annually and spawn and produce new wreckfish. So we are looking at sites that we need to protect so that these guys can grow to their awesome size. Because they're tasty fish though, they may eventually be fished for. So we have to look at potentially protecting certainly their spawning habitats. So I hope that gives you, you know, some excitement about what we are beginning to discover offshore. There's so much more. Noah has done a great job of documenting what we found um, we are working in my group at the College of Charleston documenting what we are learning from it as well, but I highly recommend you go to this website and you can look at all of their expeditions in the Pacific, in the Atlantic, in the Gulf of Mexico, and if you go to any of them, ours is Windows to the Deep 2018, you search by expedition or by year and then you can find ours, and go to the image and video gallery and just get excited. Look at the video clips. Um, there's some amazing videos. There's background information, really great still images too. You can also find background pieces about why we do this. And uh, there again is the South Atlantic Fisheries Management Council talking about deep sea coral habitats. This is not from our expeditions, but it was a background piece. Deep Search, this is the one where the Alvin I mentioned followed our expedition. They went back in 2019, so they have two sites still on the NOAA website. And you can look at their images and videos and look, learn from what they found as well. It's tons of material. In 2019, NOAA went back to new sites within the Blake Plateau area. Um, so Windows to the Deep 2019. And guess what? They found even more deep sea coral. This coral is almost six feet tall. It's a bamboo coral, thousands of years old, potentially. This is another of those bubble gum corals, six feet tall. They're huge. They're unbelievable. And then the final expedition of 2019 before COVID hit basically in 2020, was another part, these are some of the dives on the um, 1907 is the expedition number. And again, bamboo corals, you see why we call it bamboo coral and with the individual polyps and others. And unfortunately, we often see evidence of uh, marine debris, but they also saw lots of living Ophelia pertusa. So all of those, oops, that was from my last webinar. All of those websites give you so much more than I can give you in 45 minutes. So I'm gonna stop here. I hope I've um, sparked your interest to go to the NOAA website and I'll take some questions. I believe Stephanie, you've been following with some of the chat room questions. Yes, yeah, thank you so much. This is so interesting. So if you have questions, um, you can either add, put them in the chat, which I, um, oh, Thank you, Mark. I had put your link into the chat, but obviously I typed it wrong. So sorry about that. So they could click it right away. Um, but if you have questions, but I'm curious if um, once COVID is over and you're back to exploring again, where is the next spot that you are looking to map and explore? Oh my gosh, what a great <laughs> question. Because last uh, summer 
uh, was the beginning of the 2020 field season, there were all sorts of expeditions planned that didn't happen. 2021, the Okeanos was supposed to go back to the Pacific. So we're hoping the Atlantic gets its fair due and gets another year. They were actually going not to our region, they were going to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and um, to some of the, the deep waters off of the North Atlantic coast. So it, they weren't planning to come back to our region, mm. um, unfortunately, but it's still very exciting um, dives. And I will say that um, I teach seafloor mapping at the College of Charleston. So if any of you know students who might be interested in learning seafloor mapping, probably 10 of my students have been on the mapping expeditions with NOAA as interns. And the, of course, their, their, their world just opened up. We don't take students on the ROV dive cruises because there's not enough space. That's understandable. Um, I also got a text questions for someone who knew my personal text, my phone number. But if money was not an option, where was one place that you would want to dive and do to dive and research? Is there some place around the world that you would love to? Oh, anywhere or just on mm -hmm. anywhere? Money's oh, not anywhere. an option. Anywhere. I'm mm -hmm. pretty interested in uh, the Mid Atlantic Ridge because of the plate tectonics and because of hydrothermal vents. Um, I've done some exploration using ROVs on hydrothermal vents off of Washington State with the University of Washington, and it's pretty hard to be an active hydrothermal vent. <laughs> but this, this was pretty amazing what we did here. Well, that's awesome. Well, does anyone else? Uh, oh. I was gonna say, does anyone else have any questions they wanna ask? Um, Cause we also have Rachel on the line um, who I think was going to, if you want to Rachel, you can turn off, come on and give a little, a little talk about how you were a part of making sure this lecture happened this evening. Mm -hmm. Oh, we, I got one more text question. Um, are these corals more resilient to global warming compared to shallow water corals? <laughs> I get that question every <laughs> time. So that's, I should actually have mentioned it because I always get the question. Because they are living in cold, deep waters um, that aren't nearly as influenced by coastal runoff or you know, human effects, and because the temperature isn't going to vary as much, they are not going to be impacted as much. However, if global warming and cooling, whatever happens, varies the Gulf Stream, in any way that could certainly influence the growth of these coral mounds through time. But on the short term, they're not nearly as influenced by climate change as the shallow water corals. Great, yeah, I can um, hop in too. Sorry, my camera is not working right now, no but problem. I'll just say that I am Rachel with the, I'm the Land Water Wildlife Project Manager over at the Coastal Conservation League, which is based out of Charleston, South Carolina. And so one of the ways that um, we thought that this would just be a great uh, webinar for everyone to see is because Leslie came and did a internal one for us during a lunch program and and a lot of our staff is not marine based or marine focused and they all really really enjoyed it and so we thought that everyone else should enjoy it too and Leslie's been everyone so everyone should know about this yes <laughs> and and luckily Leslie agreed <laughs> enthusiastically so um I'll just say thank you to both of you guys for um Stephanie one for you guys hosting this as a naturalist 101 series um and now that I know about them I'll have to be on the lookout for the other programs and Leslie likewise to you for um putting on a great presentation. Thank you. I enjoy talking about something that interests everyone. It's, I've never found someone who isn't interested in this expedition. So it's great to have that. <laughs> well, thank you both so much. Um, this is really great to learn about something that's here on our coast that most of us are not aware of. Um, I know that as a coastal resident, um, Grace Reef always gets talked about, but the fact that we have these even larger area of deeper sea corals and not even knowing what's out there and still discovering species is so fascinating. It just makes 
us even more proud to live where we do. So thank you so Best much. For, <laughs> thank you so much for coming out. Oh, I think, oh, sorry, the chat just came up. <laughs> oh, another big thank you to you for doing this. Um, so if you are interested, this is recorded. And so I will be putting it up on YouTube. You'll get an email if you registered um, with that link once it's done so you can share it. Um, but if you do have any other questions, we can make sure those get passed along. If you, something comes up, we can get those all answered um, for you. And just to put it on your calendars, to believe that 2021 is right around the corner, our next Naturals 101 will be January 21st. And like most Januaries, it's going to be our legislative preview. So learning what 100 miles will be doing up at the Georgia legislation session this coming um, year. So thank you so much, Dr. Sauter. We really appreciate you taking the time to speak to us tonight. And um, I can't wait to learn more about deep sea corals. My pleasure, thanks. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone.